record. Okay, so now it should be recording. That means you can see it on YouTube afterwards. And yes, I will also open the chat this time in case some people ask questions there that they don't want to ask on voice. Um, Well, apparently Zoom does that to you from the question from the chat. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so this is the code from last week. We will get back to that in a second. Let me just get to the slides and make sure that now that I changed windows that the slides are also visible. And they seem to be amazing. Okay, so last week I promised you that we would be getting rid of a lot of the UI elements in, or like a lot of the code in this uh, example that we have. Uh, we want to move all of this observe boilerplate away and we want to uh, be able to express the data that our UI shall be showing in a more, you know, in with less code basically, and uh, uh, in a more declarative style. So yeah, so let's start. So uh, let's remove some code. Uh, the solution to this seems to be the title of the slides: data and view bindings. So uh, that's uh, what we are going to be looking into today. Uh, so, yeah, it's pretty familiar structure by now. What is a view binding? What is a data binding? And some live example in between topics that demonstrates uh, how to use them and some nice tips to use them. And we will also be using them a lot with what we did last week, which was uh, view models and live data. So uh, data binding works really well with live data, as we will see. Um, Basically, when you take all of these things that have been discussed over the past couple of weeks, all the way back to coroutines, to view models, live data, and today view bindings and data bindings, you will have a lot of great tools on your hands to uh, create really good apps, uh, where you can focus a lot on your idea and what you want to achieve, and let all of these amazing libraries take care of the more boring stuff. Also with navigation in mind, you will be able to create apps with many fragments, multiple um, views, and be able to update the UIs in a reactive way. And you will be able to focus mostly on your logic. Uh, of course, there's a one-time setup for a lot of this that you have to pay, but that's pretty minor compared to managing all of these details by yourself. Uh, so let's start by looking at view bindings. Uh, these are the simpler concept of the two, so that's why it's nice to start with them. Uh, so what problems are they trying to solve? Actually, I was going to try something else before this. Um, since I don't have this have the menti for this week with the interactive polls, I realized that Zoom has some polls. So this is a great chance for us to test the polls in Zoom. Um, wow, it opens a browser. Okay, well, I'm going to add a question to this meeting and see if it works. So what is your, no, what title? Okay, experience. Anonymous, sure. And the question is, um, what is your experience with today's topics? And it's uh, much. A bit. Not much. Okay. Something like that. Let's see if that works. Uh, so you should be able to open the polling and uh, uh, let's see if the Zoom polling is working out for us today. Launch polling, yeah. Okay, so now it's in progress. At least it says that it's in progress. Uh, 
and it seems to be working. I don't know if you guys can even see the results or if you see it shared on my screen or if this is just a gray box, which it might be. It is a gray box. We don't see the results. Okay. I guess you'll see it when I end the polling, hopefully. If not, I will announce the results. So when, when you open the poll, we got a pop-up with the questionnaire and yep. then we could just select the answer, yeah. Okay, nice. So it seems to be working quite well then. Yeah, so 14 out of 19 have voted. I will end the polling now. Share the results. I guess you can see the results now. Yeah, we got similar pop-up, same as for the questions now with the results. Okay, nice. So uh, that's good. It's uh, nice that you don't know anything up front because you will learn a lot more. And again, for those of you who have a bit of experience, maybe you'll pick up some new tricks and refresh what you already know. So uh, hopefully everyone will get something from this at the end of the, at the, end of the day. So. But it's good that uh, Zoom polling works. So. Okay, so what problems is this trying to solve? So from before, you know that you have to use find view by our ID or just the Kotlin synthetic access, uh, which is when you just use the ID of the view directly in the code. Uh, and both of these have can have issues. For example, find by view by ID is a lot of boilerplate. Uh, you have to type as create a variable, for example, button, and you have to assign it to find view by ID. Then you have to add a generic parameter to say what type is it. Is it a button? Is it a text view? And then finally, you have to pass the ID. And if you pass the ID of something that is like not a button, then you know that's on you. And same with the synthetic axis. Uh, that's great. You don't have to use find by view by ID anymore. Uh, and you actually have the type of the of the view into it. Uh, however, you basically have access to these classes from anywhere. So if you use the wrong ID in the wrong fragment, then that's not going to exist in there. And you will have like null pointer exceptions and it's not no fun anymore. Uh, but if you're consistent and you know that this particular view exists in that fragment or activity, then you will be able to use this. Still, it's not as type safe as you might, might want it to be. And it's also not very null safe. And if you have like um, in a vertical layout, you have a different XML file to describe the layout than you do in a landscape mode, then you have to do a lot of weird if logic in order to figure out if the ID is actually valid. And likewise with find view by ID. So uh, you don't have null safety if in case of different layouts for different uh, uh, orientations, for example, or different screen sizes can be anything. If just something has a UI element that the other one doesn't, you will run into some issues. So this is a chart of the uh, current, or it's not current, it's a, you know the state before this stuff got introduced. Um, and there we have like find view by ID. It's not very elegant because it's a lot of boilerplate. And you don't have any safety because you can say that it's a button, but pass, is, pass it the ID of a text view. But it's very fast. Um, better enough, it's just some other library. We're not going to look at this. And then you have the synthetic operators. They are quite elegant because you just type the name of the ID directly. But you have no safety because you can just access it from anywhere. And it doesn't care if that layout is actually active currently. So I mean. It's kind of baiting, but what will this last option be if this is data binding and this is the question marks? Um, uh, yeah, so I will spoil you unless you, oh, what happened now? No, I clicked the wrong button. It's going to see the chat, yes. So uh, yeah, so the last one is view binding. Uh, it's quite elegant. It's perfectly compile time safe, and it's also got null safety and type safety. And it's also very fast on the build speed. So that sounds great. Um, what does it do? Well, it's a very fast uh, annotation processing based library solution, which means that it uses annotation processing, like um, uh, it reads sort of metadata from your XML files and generates classes from this. Like it processes some annotations, like you can maybe have seen them in Java before with like the at 
like room uses them as, as well with like at entity and you have at database and you have at uh, dio in front of things so let's just open our uh, to show it up here so you have at entity so you sort of annotate this class with this and then some annotation processor goes in and generates a class for this so it's a similar similar concept except uh, now it does it for your xml files and creates classes that represent your XML files with based on all of the attributes you just put in there. So basically for every XML file you have in your project, uh, the view binding library is going to generate a class for every single one. So if you have a, an XML called activity underscore main, it will generate a class called activity main binding. So it's the uh, Pascal case version of your XML file with binding uh, suffixed at the end. Uh, and this class is basically holds just data. So it holds a type safe and null safe reference to all of the views in this XML file that have an ID. So if you give a view an ID, it will be in this class. If it doesn't have an ID, it will not be in this class. So uh, any view you need to reference in your code, if you give it an ID and enable view binding, you will find it in this class. So it's type safe in that it knows what kind of view it is. So if you create a button and give it an ID, the type of the variable in this binding class is going to be of type button. If that button is only present in landscape mode, but not in, in uh, uh, portrait mode, then the, the type is going to be button question mark. So it's a nullable button. Because if you're in landscape mode, that's the only way uh, the button is going to be visible if that's the only XML file where it's present. Which means you can just use uh, the question mark operator as well um, to figure out whether you need to do some action with this button. And that's a lot cleaner than having to figure out your own, the orientation yourself. And then if you at some point decide to change that the button should be in portrait mode and not in landscape mode, you have to change all of your logic. Whereas with uh, if you use the binding class, it's going to just work already because um, you just use the question mark and which uh, means if it's null, then you don't do anything, and if it's not null, then you work on it. So it doesn't care in what mode it's actually null. Um, so uh, to enable it, uh, you simply put this in your build Gradle, Gradle file. Uh, and by doing this, suddenly it's, it's going to just generate the classes for you. Uh, and that's the only thing you really need. The other thing you need is you need at least Android Studio 3.6. So if you haven't updated already, you have to update if you want to use view binding because that's when it's introduced. So to show you this in this example project, if I go to the build.gradle file, uh, we have here under Android, we simply enable view binding. It's a bit of a spoiler, but this is what we'll need later. But for now, let's just concentrate that to enable view binding. You just set it to be enabled. And that's really all we need to do. Now, if you build from the first time, it will actually generate all the classes that you need, like the binding classes. So let's uh, take what we have in the current example and start using the view bindings in it. So. View bindings, we'll discuss the differences between view binding and data binding once we get to data binding. But for now, we'll just start with the view bindings. So I'll see if there are any questions before I move on. No. And then I will check the participants as well and make sure that if you want to go uh, slower or faster, or it's okay, so you can just hit the green yes or the slower, faster buttons. Just to make sure that it's digestible. Okay, seems to be fine. So then we will start looking at putting view bindings into this. So right now you will see that I just used the Kotlin synthetic accessors, which comes from this class, which is generated as well from the XML, but uh, in a different way. So we are accessing latest name, which is this text view. And because the ID is in here, uh, with Kotlin, we can just access it also in here. 
and which call set text. However, if this we use this in the other in the other fragment that we have where we enter the expenses, uh, this you could still put this in here and start to interact with it. But since it would be no in that case, it wouldn't work. It would crash your app. But it wouldn't tell you that it would be crashing your app because it doesn't care. It just it's some reference to that uh, that ID. So we, in order for this to actually work, we must have inflated the correct layout. So that's important to note. We could have also used find view by ID in here if you wanted to go find uh, well, it's really activity, I guess. And then we have to say, okay, what is latest name? I, is it, what is it? It's a, okay, so it's a text view. So we have to specify text view. And then we have to specify, uh, sorry, r.id. What's the ID? You know, we have to go look for that. It's called latest name. And if you were unlucky, maybe you passed in the cancel button. Um, yeah, I'm going to go like this. If we pass in the cancel button, we say it's text view. It, it, it's not going to warn you. So if you if you messed it up, messed up the type, you know, it's uh, it's on you. So um, let's stop using these guys and start using the view bindings instead. Um, so to do that, we have to use the binding class as mentioned before, and since the um, let's find the layout. Since this layout is called for the expense list fragment, uh, the layout is called fragment expense list. So you can think for two seconds what you think the binding class is going to be called. So if you guessed fragment expense list binding, then you have started to understand the naming convention. So in a fragment, we will want to create a variable on the fragment. I'm gonna make it a private late in it var late in it because we're gonna initialize it. We can't initialize it in the constructor or here, but we are going to so sort of like a lazy initialization. We're gonna initialize it in this function, and I'm gonna just call it. Uh, I can call it binding. I can call it views. Uh, just v or b, but uh, for now I'll just call it binding. And it, the type of this is fragment expense list binding, which is what we said. So now I can't use this until I've initialized it. But so I've, with, by saying late in it, I'm kind of promising that I will initialize it before I use it. So in on create view, where before we would just inflate this layout, uh, I'm going to use the binding class to inflate it as well. So uh, since the binding class comes with its own inflate method, which is actually also a lot easier to use than the regular layout inflator, so another uh, bonus for using view bindings always. So we're going to set that our binding is equal to the fragment expense list binding, which is this class, and it has, has a static method called inflate, and we're going to pass it basically the same as here. So except we don't have to specify the layout because it already knows its own layout since it's generated from an XML. So it knows that this is the layout. Uh, so the, we have, instead we have to pass it the inflator, which is this one. And we have to specify the view group, which is this one. And then we have to specify attach to root, which is the same as this one. And so now we have inflated our layout through this class. And what this does uh, behind the scenes as well is ass assign all the variables in this one. So we can actually go look at what the view binding one have generated by clicking on this one. Well, it wasn't so simple, unfortunately. But it's in, in Java somewhere where it has generated file. Java generated. But, you know, supposed to put it in here somewhere. Anyway, it's not so important. The point is that through this binding class, we now have access to all of the views that have IDs. So we can access live info, expense list, uh, prename add, go button, all of that. And they all have type, the correct type. So this is text view, recipe view, all of that stuff. And none of them are nullable, so there's no question marks because we only have one layout and it's always going to be present. So through this, we can now access all the views. We will know that these views for sure exist, so there will never, never be any null pointer exceptions. Um, and uh, we don't run into the danger of using the wrong type, like with find view by ID. 
Um, and also we can't access IDs that don't exist in this particular XML. So um, we're not going to do much else in on create view. The only thing that's important to note is that this binding, because of the life cycle of a fragment, is only valid be between on create view and on destroy view. So as before and after that, this binding is no longer valid. So keep that in mind. Um, so instead of returning the inflated one as well, we have to ex return the binding of root. So that's a special member, which is the root uh, view of this binding once you've inflated it. So, and that's how you would use it in a fragment. So still this one, the code should still be running, but we want to update all of our view accesses to use the this binding class instead of the synthetic accessors. So instead of expense list.apply, we want to go through the binding and do the same thing. Because now we know that this is always going to be valid. It's not going to be null. And we're going to be safe uh, when we access it. So we have to do that for all of the views that we are using. And normally, in a normal project, you would do this from the start. And view bindings is just recommended to enable now that you got Android Studio 3.6 because one, they're super fast to generate. You don't will, will not have any issues and they're automatically generated for every class. So the, the literally the only thing you need to do to get going is to do this and have Android Studio 3.6. And then you get all of these classes and then you will just start accessing all of your data through this binding class. And like this, so now we will have now we have updated everything. So let's just run it again and make sure that our data is still working. Yep, so we still have the clicks. We have all the variables set. Everything seems to be working. If we type this to filter, we have the same result as we did before. Great, so that's how you would add them in a fragment. Uh, let's add them to our activity as well because it would be slightly, it's basically the same thing, but let's just add it to the activity as well so you can see the difference. So let's go to the main activity. So as you can see in an activity, uh, we use set content view instead of returning the view in a on create view function. We don't have that in an activity. This is a fragment only thing. So in the fragment in the activity, we are expected to set the layout in on create with this function. So apart from that, it's more or less the same procedure. We will create a private variable called binding. Uh, its type is not going to be the same type as before. We're going to now have a main activity. Oh no, it's actually called activity main because that's the title of the XML. So it's activity main, so ty XML title with binding. So here we're going to do the same thing, binding equals activity main binding uh, dot inflate. And we've just passed the layout inflator in this case. And then instead of setting it to setting the content view to this one, we set it to the binding dot root view. And basically, so far there's no difference, but that's that's the point. The point is that what you get from this is the type safe and null safe access to all members. So now we didn't actually change it. So I guess we should do that and make sure we use binding dot toolbar instead of just toolbar. And likewise here, binding dot toolbar, uh, binding dot main drawer layout, navigation view and bottom nav. Unless this was not. Yeah, it's a call button now. Okay. So now we have the same functionality, just with uh, just an activity as well. So it's pretty simple, as you can see, to integrate it. It's just to build the gradle lines, and then you have to inflate it with the binding class instead, and make sure that you either in the fragment return the view, or in the activity set the content view to be the root view of that new infl newly inflated layout. And then in the end, we still have the same result, except now we have better, a better way to access all of our data. Uh, we have one more fragment. Um, 
I don't I don't think we will be working too much in this one, but uh, I will provide you with the code files afterwards. So if you want to do it as an exercise, you can try to update this one to use the use the binding class for this one as well. So I'll leave that up to you guys. And then I will check the chat again. So someone seems to have issue with the audio, but most people seem to be fine. Um, so hopefully it doesn't seem to be an issue in this end. So hopefully that will be resolved. Yeah, okay. Anyway, if you have any questions about the view bindings, that's now is the time to start to ask. If not, we will move on to data binding where I will fulfill my promise to get rid of this boilerplate. View bindings won't do that for you. That's part of the reason they're a lot faster. Okay, so on to the what I would say the fun stuff, which is the data binding library. It's been around a little bit longer than the view binding. Um, so uh, part of the reason view bindings were motivated uh, to be created was that a lot of people actually use data binding just to emulate view binding in a way. So now they created their own view binding library, which sort of does, does that in a more lightweight manner. But technically you can achieve the same thing anyway. Uh, problems that data binding are trying to solve. So as we can see, lots of boilerplate to hook up the data with the UI. We have to write all of this just to observe various data types. Uh, of course, this is a lot better than what it would have been without live data as we saw last week, because then we would have to manually check all of these fields for when they update and then call updating the UI and all of that ourselves. So it's already a lot better, but um, this is, uh, New feed, these are new features in Android, so we will be able to make it even better than what it currently is. Uh, yes, I could be, well, yes. So basically the inflator just takes your XML file, uh, parses it, uh, so when we have all of these, uh, so this is the XML file. We have a linear layout, card view, linear layout. So an inflator will basically go through this layout and sort of inflate or like create the actual uh, classes for these views. views. Uh, so you have them in code because this is just a data file. It just describes what the UI should look like. Uh, the inflator will actually take these uh, descriptions from the data format and create types uh, in Android, like the actual button that you will be interacting with. And so it doesn't, so it's not just the uh, description of the UI, it actually inf inflates it in a way. So you get all these UI ML elements. They, they don't actually inflate, but you know, they are created and uh, set up so they match the, data, the format described in the XML. Anyway, so where was I? Yeah, so we have a lot of boilerplate in here, but it's a lot better than what it used to be, but we can do even better, so. Uh, and in this case, there can be so many parameters to drive from code if you have a really complex application. So you just don't understand like, your logic anymore. Um, suddenly you see a lot of UI code and then there's some logic dealing with what your app is supposed to do. And it all gets mixed up a lot and you don't really, uh, you start losing track of what is happening. So yeah, you'll have those kind of things mixed up. Uh, and that can be solved with the data binding library. So, I mean, this isn't that much boilerplate, so it's technically livable. You don't really need it for this example, but what if you had a lot more of these guys uh, and currently our app doesn't really do a lot. It just adds expenses to a list. But if it had a lot more business logic that could be in here, it could be in the view model, um, then we might at some point get a lot of mix up. So what does data bind it was? So now let's look at data bindings. They are slower to generate at view bindings, but they are more powerful. So the reason you would use view bindings by default is because they're a lot faster. They have almost no overhead to your, uh, by adding them to your project and they're extremely quick to get started with and using them. So that's why view binding should be your default. 
Uh, data binding also uses annotation processing. So uh, again, from the XML file and generates binding classes behind the scenes. So if you specify that one layout should use data binding, then the data binding is the one that's going to be generating the class for it. Uh, so it's very compatible with view bindings. Um, so you have to specifically ex enable data binding for particular XML files. Um, it won't automatically do it for all of them. So to enable data binding for a particular XML, you have to specify that it should be enabled for that particular XML file. They're very good for layouts where there's a lot of UI interaction and thing variables that depend on each other and where you want to, where there's a lot going on and a lot of interaction that you don't want to manage yourself. And they let you add variables to the XML that will drive the UI. So with data binding, we're going to add variables to the XML file that you can set from the code, which will automatically drive the UI. So you don't no longer have to say that the text view dot set text becomes some text. Instead, you just set a variable in the XML, and then the XML will know what UI element uses this variable and update those elements in a way. Uh, lastly, a data binding can be one way or two way. Uh, one way data bindings are what you're going to be using most of the time, and that just means that the data binding reads uh, a value from uh, your code and uses that to display it in the UI. With two-way data binding, it means that the data binding can also write those variables back to your code. So if you change something, for example, in an edit text, you can have the data binding write the text to a variable and then have some other UI element listen to this variable and then you sort of get all of these interactions for free without having to manage it yourself. So one way is the one you're gonna be using the most. Two-way, you might use it sometimes uh, in those cases where you need the UI to also update values based on changes. Uh, so I spoiled you, spoiled you about this earlier, but enabling data binding generation is, you know, it's a lot, it's less simple, but still very doable. Technically it's the same. Uh, so you go in here, you enable data binding. Uh, you can use either data binding or view binding, or you can use both. Uh, and uh, then you also need to wrap the XML files with layout qualifiers. So this is a different one that, than a linear layout or frame layout or something else. This is specifically for data binding. And that's what we will do when we start adding it to our project in the example afterwards. Um, so let's quickly look at some more on one day data binding, one way data binding. Uh, it's as I said, mostly used when the binding class reads the data from somewhere in your code. Uh, with regular variables, for example, like an integer or a string, you need to update manually. So you need to set this variable manually when it updates because the UI will just read from it. However, uh, with live data, as we uh, talked about last week, uh, the data binding will take care of automatically subscribing and updating the value whenever the live data updates. So as we talked about, live data is an observable data type. So you can observe the value and when it changes, it triggers all of its observers and then they can do something with it. So that's exactly what we are doing in here right now. We are observing the name text and when the value changes, then we're setting the text of the latest name to this uh, new value. Uh, but the data binding can take care of automatically subscribing and observing the values and of course also unsubscribing and it will uh, deal with all of that for you. So that's nice. That's, uh, so you're starting to see how we're going to get rid of some of the code here now. Uh, then there's two-way data binding. So when the data binding both reads the value, but it can also set it, uh, it doesn't work on all types uh, because, uh, for example, with a text view, uh, there's no way to edit it as a user. You can't just click on a text view and change it but you can implement support for it if you need it. So uh, we can look at that if we have the time. Uh, a good candidate for two-way can be an, an edit text. So when you type some text, it will actually set the variable instead of you having to uh, do it yourself. And then if the variable is changed by someone else, it's also going to update the edit text. Uh, and we haven't looked at any of the syntax for data binding yet, but um, in order to use two-way, you have to use uh, there's ba it's basically at equals and an expression instead of just at expression. So 
Uh, that might not make much sense right now, but when you go back and look at the slides later, or when we do the example, uh, this is going to make sense. Finally, with data binding, uh, not all attributes are supported up front. So most attributes for all the default views in Android, like the text view, edit text, image views, all of that stuff, most of them are already supported out of the box, but some might not. And if you create your own views or have your own, want to add some extra logic to your app, which you will in most cases, uh, you can add custom attributes through something called a binding adapter. Uh, and that's basically a function that takes in some kind of a view. So if this is, works on any view, you're taking a view. If it only works in text views, you're taking a text view and so on. Uh, and the expected result of the expression. So for example, if you want some, some attribute to take an integer and then update a view based on that value, then you would declare an integer. If you wanted it to take a string, then you put string in here. So basically, uh, this will also make more sense when we do the example, but the way you use this in XML then is that you say uh, on any view, you just add this attribute to the XML and say that, and the expression inside of this, these brackets will have to evaluate to an integer. If it doesn't, then it's not going to work. So basically the view type is the view that you put this attribute on and the type of the second parameter is the uh, value that the expression inside of the data binding has to evaluate to. So again, this will make more sense once we look at the example. So that was all of my slides. Uh, the rest of today is basically just looking at all of this with data binding and adding it to our project. So you will be able to see how to use it in practice. In practice. Sorry. And uh, hopefully get some ideas on how we can expand on that. And I will give you some resources uh, to learn more about it because we won't have time to cover everything about them, but you will be able to know uh, the most important things about everything. Nice. Okay. So before we start with data binding, I will take a five minute break. So it's 2.55 now, so at 3 p.m. or 1500, uh, we will start with a data binding example. So I will see you in five minutes.
So um, there was a question about the exam. So unfortunately, the faculty has not made the decision yet, which is a bit strange because they've made the decision that we should have a solution by the end of the month and they don't have the uh, resolution on how we should do it. So there is one proposal that the exam should take exam same time as the planned one and should be the same time frame as the planned one. But that doesn't work too well for a lot of subjects. Uh, there was another proposal to ban oral exams and don't have any oral evaluations of students' work, which also had a bit of problem with a lot of courses. So we effectively are still waiting. So there, there is no resolution on the format of the exams. It is very likely we will need to do something. And I hope it will be based on the coordinators, course coordinators decisions, not done by the faculty. Uh, but we, as department, we are waiting for the faculty to make the final um, ruling on this. So I can't tell you yet uh, how we will do it. Um, if they go with the option of take home exams and if they give the course coordinators a freedom to decide, um, I was thinking, and I haven't chatted with Christopher yet, but I was thinking of doing evaluation based on the project work instead of the exam. Um, and if that was rendered to be legal, then we probably will go with that. So instead of having sort of a written exam, we would have some sort of a written, written report and some project work based uh, at home. But um, I don't know yet. So we, we're waiting for the faculty to make the final decision. Uh, sorry, Carl, for uh, getting in. Yeah, no worries. It's, uh, it's fine. It's important information. So. Um, anyway, let's, uh, let's get back to it. So. So uh, let's start by adding it to one of our pre-existing fragments by uh, modifying the XML, which is the first step that we need to do. So we already enabled data binding for our project, so which we did in the build.gradle file. We enabled data binding uh, next to view binding. You can put it anywhere. You can put it here or anywhere, as long as it's inside Android brackets. So. Um, Let's start by adding it to the XML because right now we're using the view binding. So, but we want to use the data binding for this uh, XML file and fragment. But currently they don't exist because, as mentioned, uh, data binding does not automatically create it for you. You have to opt into it. So, this is the expense list fragment. So, let's go into our expense list fragment XML. And so what we needed to do, according to the slides, was to add layout around everything. Now, as soon as you have added data binding to the build.gradle file, if you click on the root element and hit Alt-Enter, uh, you actually have an option of the first one to convert it to a data binding layout. So that's the simplest way. Uh, you must have enabled data binding in build.gradle, otherwise this is not going to show. So click the root element and hit Alt-Enter. And then you hit enter one once more, and now you get uh, the data binding layout. So as you can see, it added layout around everything. Uh, and then you have this new section, which is called data. Uh, in the data section, this is where you declare variables that your data binding can access. So if we were to start simple, uh, let's see if we want to update. We want to just show the num the name the current name uh, with this data. So the naive quick forward way to do it is to add a variable. Uh, it takes a name and a type. So we're just gonna call it the name for now. And the type of this is a string. So now we have one variable in the data binding called the name and the type is string. So it doesn't, it's not used anywhere. So this wouldn't currently change how our app works. But if we click, click on the name view, here we're setting the text. 
So instead, what we don't want to do now is we don't want to set the text to this string. We want to use the value of our variable that is called the name. Uh, so the way you would do that is you would use the at syntax. And then you can put, for example, the name inside of, the, 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 inside of this. So you have at and then an opening curly bracket. And here you can write some data binding expression. Like, so this supports a lot of the uh, conventional uh, operations that you can do in regular code. So you can use and operator or you can use bitwise and, and you have access to more things. You can call functions in here. You can set it to the length. So now, and you can do a lot in here basically. Not everything, but you can do a lot. Um, so for now, we wanna just set this text to the name. Uh, if you run the program, if it even runs, it does. And I type a name, it's going to show, but it's not because of this. Like, uh, it's because we haven't, we're still using the view binding in here, basically. We're not actually, uh, and in here, we still have set text. We still set the name here. Uh, so, uh, it's not really telling us anything. So for now, I'm going to comment out everything that adds logic to the buttons um, and uh, everything else. And we're just gonna do it with the data binding for now. So there's one difference with inflator. Again, when we use the data binding, instead of using the binding class directly, uh, we will use something called data binding util. And this one has basically an inflate method. And now we have to specify the type, which is fragment expense list binding. So this is the same type, it's called the same as it is in view binding. Uh, you just inflate it with this one instead. And other than that, the parameters should be the same. Am I importing? It twice, yeah, probably. No, the difference is that we have to specify the layout resource in here as well. So that's r.layout.fragment expense list. And then we set our binding to this value instead. So now this one is not needed anymore because it can it knows the type from the ID. Uh, and then we just have the inflator, so the layout file, uh, the container, and we don't attach it to the parent. That's what always happens, mostly. And then we return the root view again. So now we have enabled this data binding class that's generated from the XML. So what we will see if we try to access something on this is that as before, it has all of the uh, all of the views, so that hasn't changed. Uh, all of the rest of our code should still be working. What it has additionally is something called the name, which is the variable that we set. So instead of going to uh, our text view with the latest name, what we will do is set the variable called the name, and the data binding layout knows that uh, that latest name as we see in here, latest name is using this variable as its text. So this variable could be used in all, like all of the text views if you really wanted to. And then by just setting the variable, the name, everything would know that, oh, okay, um, this is our new value. So now I'm gonna just set the name to something like, hello world. And now the text is hello world. So we didn't say that the text view should have this. We just set the variable of the data binding to this. And then the text view knows that I'm, I'm just gonna display this variable. So whatever it is, that's what I'm gonna show. Um, nice, so now we used our first data binding expression. Uh, however, what we want to do probably is not, we want to have the same functionality as we did before with name colon. So I do have the string resource that I used before. So the way you can use that still is you just specify that you want to use string, 
I don't remember what it's called, but it's in here and it's called. Yeah, so it's here, it's label name, which has name colon and then a format string. So we're gonna put that. And then if you put parentheses, we will put the name in the parentheses and this will format the string with this variable. So now we have a localizable string uh, that will be formatted with this variable. And what we see now is that the name, it goes name colon, hello world. So um, now we have a formatted string uh, set from the data binding. Uh, however, this is kind of tedious. Like if you have one variable for every single thing you need, that's gonna be a lot of variables. So uh, thankfully from last week, uh, we worked with something called a view model. Um, in this case, we have our expense view model, which holds all of the examples from last week. So what we can do and what you are very likely to do is just to call this variable for view model. Or maybe we're gonna call it VM for short here. So we have less to type. And the type of this is going to be our expense view model. So now, instead of using a string or a number directly, what we're going to use is that our variable is going to be our view model. And then in here, instead of using the name, we would have to go uh, VM, okay, so that, that's our view model, and dot, and what's it called? I think it's called name text. Yeah, so it's called name text. So by setting this, we now, we're not setting it to the name text of our view model. And it's no longer called the name. So what we have to do instead is we have to set our VM. We have to set that to our view model. So we already have a view model in this class. So we're gonna set that to view model. And by doing that, we now have our XML can now access all of the data in our view model. And we don't really have to do much else here. Since, um, in the view model, name text is live data. And since this is now set to the value of that live data, data binding is clever. So it knows to subscribe uh, through the observer of this value in the view model. It now, since we are assigning it to name text, which is live data, data binding will subscribe to this value. And every time this value updates, the data binding will also update. So you no longer have to do it manually. So by combining the power of live data with the power of data bindings, your UI will now update anytime this variable updates without you having to write anything else like than this. Uh, actually, that's a bit of a lie. We have to set one more thing on this binding since we're working with live data. Uh, if you remember from, uh, for example, this observer, which now observes the name text, um, what we have, what we do in here when we observe is that we have to provide it a life cycle owner as well. Cause this is what says how, you know, when are we going to observe this value and makes the live data also smart enough to only push push updates if this view is on the screen. So we have to provide the binding with what life cycle owner we want to use. So, but that thankfully that's very simple. You just go life cycle owner and you just set it to view life cycle owner. So now it knows what lifecycle owner to use when it subscribes to live data. Which means since we now have in our fragment expense, we are now saying this text should be formatted with this value using our view model name text, which is live data. This is sort of done for us. So instead of observing the name text manually, we can get rid of this and say, well, the data binding is going to take care of the subscription for us and it's going to update the view UI. Uh, we should, for now, we'll put the go button back in here, which sets the name of the view model. Uh, but we will get rid of everything else. So only all this does is just set the name in the view model. It doesn't care about the UI. The UI doesn't know this, uh, except it's live data. So once this is updated, it will also actually update since we're now subscribed. So I'm gonna go curl, click go, and there you go. The name is there. We removed our observer code, and this just knows that since this updates the live data, the UI will now update as well. Excellent. Um, so 
let's do the next thing that we can do. We want to get rid of all of this after all, so let's get rid of the go buttons on click listener as well. So what we want to do, what do we actually do when we click this? Um, we are setting the name to some string. And then we are incrementing the number of clicks and clearing the text box. Uh, so let's just take this stuff. That's what we want to do. Uh, and let's add a utility function to our view model that does exactly this. So I'm going to put it just next to the name text because that's where we're going to be using it. We're going to create a function um, that we're going for simplicity, going to call click go button handler. And since it takes in a view, we're going to pass it the view. Um, since we're in the view model, we don't have to do this anymore. We can just set the name directly. And we want to be want it to be uh, the text of the other one. We want to increment the number of clicks. So here we don't want to actually set the UI anymore. We just want to increment the number of clicks because we don't actually want to mess with the UI here. We want the data binding to do that. So all we want to do is define a function that uh, does something when we are clicking on the button. So we don't actually want to clear anything either. Um, so setting the name now is going to be, well, we don't actually have access to this text field. So we're going to get rid of that and do that uh, afterwards with uh, the two-way data binding. So when we click the go button, we're actually just going to make that increment the number of clicks. Um, but we want to set this function to be called. So we don't want to do it here. So let's get rid of the on-click listener. I'll just check the chat quickly. Yeah, not much. Oops. Yeah. So we don't want to have the on click listener in here. So let's go back to our expense list fragment and let's find this go button. So we click the button and here it is. Um, so let's make sure that this guy has an on click but we don't want to set a function. We want to actually set a variable from the data binding. And from that, we have our view model dot, what did I call it? Click go button handler. So like this, we are now setting, we can set this function to be called when we click the button from the XML. And that's going to be the function on the view model. Uh, currently we're not uh, updating this value. So let's also make sure that we are subscribing to number of clicks. Uh, which will be this one. So it's the same concept. We have the at and the bracket to say it's a data binding expression. And then we have to format it with some text, which will be view model dot number of clicks. Uh, however, you may have noticed that this one is actually not live data. So let's quickly just turn it into live data as well. So it will automatically be updated. If we don't do that, we have to still manually update it. So in this case, there's no reason for it not to be. The only reason it's not is because we used as an example from last week. So, so I will make it mutable live data because this is the one we're going to be changing, which will be privates and underscore number of clicks. The value will be zero. And then we have a public one called number of clicks, which is just live data of int, where the getter is equal to number of clicks. So now this is the one that we can mutate, and this is the one we will be subscribing to. And then we have to set in here, we go have to go number of clicks uh, equals the current number of clicks, or zero if it's null sorry, the underscore one, and plus one. And same here, we have to do the underscore one. All right, we have, it's, it's dot value because it's a live data and not actually an integer, so. Um, 
and likewise series dot value. So not veil, but value. So now we just quickly turn this one into live data as well, so that we can subscribe to it in the XML through this value. So what should happen now is that when we click the button, the number of clicks is incremented. But we actually don't have any code uh, to change the UI. Yep, so the clicks is incrementing. Uh, the, currently the name isn't set, but that's our next step. So, so far we've been able to get rid of two of these guys. Um, so, um, let's also make sure that we update the name properly. So uh, it's going to be a bit simple actually, since edit texts have built in support for the two way bindings, uh, but we have to make some changes to our view model. So if we find this input text, it's called prename add. And what we want to do is to make sure that whenever you type something in here, uh, we want to, in our view model, we want to actually update this value, we want to update the value of the name text. Uh, currently, we can't update values from a data binding. So a data binding just reads the value and then shows it in the UI. With two-way data binding, we can actually also update the values that are stored. So we want to update the name text whenever this field, the text in this one, changes. Uh, and also read it back in some other uh, values. So, the way we would do that is we would say, okay, so it's a text field, that text property that we want to do something with. And if you remember from the slides, when you want to use the two-way data binding, instead of just going at and then typing the expression, which would be vm.name text, we would also go at equals to say this is a two-way two -way binding. But as you will see, this is not going to work because name text is live data, not mutable live data. So in the cases where you actually need to do this, um, it's a bit ugly, but it's just the way it is. Uh, you can no longer have this separation between private and public view data, live data. You have, have to actually just expose the mutable live data directly for the data binding to be able to do anything with it. So uh, it's, it's a bit ugly, but uh, you get, what you get in return is usually worth it when you need to do it. So uh, in this case, we have to make the name text just the mutable live data and just expose that. That way, the two-way data binding can now also write this variable. So what you'll see now is that the moment we change this text, this text field updates because this text field is now actually allowed from the data binding to write to this variable. So if you write hello, you see it comes there immediately. We can write Carl, Marius, or any other name. And it's just gonna show up in here. So it, you know it's not optimized for any length. So and it updates live. So the click now increments like this, and we can write hello in here, and it will show here because this one writes to this live data. And since this text field subscribes to that live data, whenever this value is written to, this one also gets the update and it's all uh, synchronized and everyone's happy. So we don't even need the set name function anymore because our data binding now takes care of it. Excellent. So, um, Lastly, we just have these other guys as well, so times and reset, let's quickly add them in because they're mostly the same, so that's gonna be repetition. So time since reset, that's this one. So it's at brackets, this guy, and then vm.time, what, what did I call it? Uh, let's just see what I called it. Should be able to autocomplete, but doesn't always. Time since reset probably because I don't have the end brackets. Yeah. So there we go, time since reset. And the final one is the top expense. So again, like this. And then vm.top expense. 
So what you'll see now is the preview has absolutely no information. So that sucks a little bit when you want to edit the XML, you want to see what it looks like with some text. So what's possible to do is that after the expression, you can set comma and set the default value and set it to hello, for example. And then it will show a default value that you can preview. If you don't specify default, then it doesn't show. So this default value will also be the one that's uh, will be present until uh, you set the value. So you can actually make this just string live updates, and then you're sort of back where you where you left it. But if you already know what it looks like and you don't necessarily feel that you need it, you don't have to put it in there. Uh, so what we should have now is more or less the same functionality as we used to. With the timer going up, we have our top expense, we have the clicks, and then when we type the name, it's all updated. Which means uh, the times is reset can be deleted and the top expense can be deleted. Um, and the only thing that we have left is our recycler view. Um, so what we could try to do is click on our recycler view and set our set some value in here, but there's no real there's not really any way to set this list because a recycler view can use a different adapter for every project. Uh, it can be a different way you need to observe it or set the data. So for this example, we are going to create a custom attribute that we can use in our data binding to also get rid of this stuff. Since right now we don't see any of the data, if we were to quickly re-uncomment this, we can look at it and see that well, all of our data is there, it's just that we don't show it yet. So, And what you'll see now as well is that when we write uh, our name, the search update is actually live. So it's a live filter right now, Arnold. Carl, let's try Chris or Geralt. And so now we have the live filtering as well. So that's kind of cool. That's a sub by effect of the data binding. Uh, but we want to get rid of this and rather have it set up for us automatically. So our main activity or our, sorry, our expenseless fragment is as clean as possible. So for that, I'm going to create a new file where we can put our own custom data binding adapters. So let's create a new file. I'm going to call it data binding uh, attributes. Just a file. And in here, we are going to start putting a custom attribute to deal with some of this. So if you remember from the slides again, uh, in order to use uh, create a custom adapter, you prefix it with at binding adapter, and then you will give the attribute a name. So in our case, you want to be able to give it, we want to set our list uh, on our expense uh, recycler view. Um, so what we can call it, we can have to give this property some name. Uh, I want to call it, I mean, it, it doesn't really matter, except if it's descriptive, it should be so you know what the property actually does. Uh, let's say we want it to be the list to use. So this is the list that the, the recycler view should display because we submitted a list. So let's call it list to use. Let's call a function with the same name and we need two parameters for this. We need the view that it can be worked on, put on this attribute. And we need the value that is the expression, uh, that the expression will expect to get. So the view is going to be a recycler view in this case. So we want to be a recycler view. So we want this attribute to only work on recycler views. Uh, and second, we wanted to get a list of expenses because that's the type our recycler view expects. So that's the type we want to uh, receive. So I'm going to call it expenses, and that's a list of expense. Uh, and basically, what we do in here is this is how it sh how the data binding library. This is actually a function it will be called. It will call 
whenever we bind something to of this type to the, to this value. So this is also how every native type is an, in Android is implemented. So the reason this works with text views and all of the other stuff is because they provide a library with binding adapters for basically all the properties like text views, text, edit text, text, like all of this is implemented up front for, for you. Uh, but we want to create our own adapter for this case. And what it's going to do is basically this stuff. So uh, it's not binding anymore. It's the view, the view adapter as an expense adapter. And we want to submit the list and the list is in this case expenses, which is what we get in here. So that's what we want to say. This is what the binding adapter is going to do. Uh, it's going to submit this list to the recycler view. Uh, so you could say, argue that this is technically not deleting the code, it's just moving it. Uh, and yes, that's true, but you can reuse this in every single fragment where you use a uh, recycler view of the same type. Uh, you can take all of your custom bindings that you write that can be used for multiple projects. You can move them to other projects, you can reuse it. And it's very clear that this file is just going to be binding data to the UI. And you actually don't get it in your fragments anymore because fragments and activities can already get big enough as it is. So. So let's use this custom attribute that we have created. It's called list to use. So let's go to our XML file and the recycler view. And in here we can now specify app list to use. And we want to go at like this to say it's a data binding property. And we want to say that this is vm dot, yeah, what is it? We want to use, uh, well, we want a list of expenses. So it's all, all expenses for, that's the one we used before. And this has, the type of this variable has to be what we said in here. So we said, this is a list of expense. So for this to work, this expression has to evaluate to this type. And likewise, where we put this property has to be on a view that is a recycler view or inherits from recycler view. So currently we are put it on a recycler view, which is the first parameter. And the, uh, the value of this expression evaluates to list of expense, which is what we get in the second parameter. Uh, which means if we run this, this is also live data. So this means that whenever the database is updating, this should update. Now it crashed, nice. Let's figure out why. So this is always what's going to happen with live coding sometimes. All right, the parameter can't be null sometimes. So we didn't actually deal with the case that this is null. Uh, so we want to make sure that uh, we only actually set it when the expenses are null, so are not null. So, so let's just do it in here. So we use let here to make sure that this code is only executed. Uh, when this is not null, let's execute this code. And the, the Lambda parameter it is now our list of expenses and it's guaranteed to not be null in here. So we only want to set it when it's not null, basically. And here we are, so now it's working. And now we have subscribed to our recycle review with a custom data binding property. So, and that's the list to use. Now in the UI, we can now change the list to use to be all expenses instead of all expenses for, which with, so right now this is filtered as it used to be. If we use all expenses instead, if you remember from last week, that is the unfiltered view. And now it's no longer filtered because we're using a different source. Uh, so uh, now our fragment is super clean. We have basically no UI code in here. Still our UI is extremely reactive and updates to basically anything we do. We do. Uh, the filtering can be enabled or disabled. Well, it actually can't, but we, we will get to that. We will show you some more custom data bindings that you can do. Um, and now we have basically no boilerplate left in here either. Um, this is for the recycler view, it's not 
got anything to do with the actual UI. So um, we can't get rid of this with data binding. So otherwise we would have. But uh, so yeah, let's write one more binding adapter that can just to show that it can be used uh, in different ways. So say we wanted to be able to uh, either filter or not filter this list. So uh, I'm going to add a checkbox to this line as well that we can check if we if it's checked, this list should be filtered. If it's not checked, then it's not going to be filtered. So let's go to our XML and figure out where this is. And then let's add a checkbox here. We're going to make sure that it's centered. Layout gravity should be center. Uh, we're going to, well, we're not going to give it text because we know what it is actually. What, the, what if we say filter? Yeah, sure, that's, that's fine. And we are going to give it an ID so we can reference it. So we're going to call this uh, filter box, something like that. Uh, so what we want to do is that when this box is checked, uh, then we want to use one live data. Otherwise, we want to use the other one. Uh, so what we can do in here, uh, so far we use pretty simple expressions. Mm, but we can use a custom property. Uh, we can try first to see if it the works the simple way, which is okay. So, so basically, filter box. Dot checked. So okay. So if if filter box is checked, then let's use vm dot all expenses for. Otherwise, yes, let's use vm dot all expenses. Let's just see if that works. So you can use expressions in here to change uh, what list to use. So right now if I type Carl, um, don't have this checked, and then if I tick it, it changes the live data automatically and you can change between the live data you want to use. So right now with very little work, you have created a list that can be either filtered or non-filtered based on this checkbox. All you had to do was add a little small uh, ternary if statement in here. Uh, you can't use regular if statement, that's why you have to use this one. Uh, because as I mentioned, the expression syntax is a bit limited compared to what you can do with uh, actual regular code. And you can access the other views in here uh, as if they were variables because they're just part of the XML, so you can use them directly. So nice, now we've added some other thing in here. Uh, so let's say we want to add another attribute for this button. Uh, this is basically just another example. So we want to say if this text field is empty, we want to hide the go button because we don't want anything to be there. We don't want you to click it if there's no text. So let's do that. Um, so what we would do, we can add a generic attribute to add to, add to any view um, that just does this behavior. So let's just say, create a binding adapter again. We want to call it um, hide um, if, so we can basically use any sort of code logic in these bindings. So we want to say hide if zero. So we want to create an attribute that says hide if zero. Let's call it hide if zero. And we want to work on any view. So if we can apply this attribute to any view and the value it takes is just a value uh, of a type integer. So what we want to do is if value equals zero, uh, then we want to go set the view.visibility equals view.gone. Otherwise, we want to set view.visibility to view.visible. So now we've created an attribute called hide if zero, and it takes an integer. So let's go to our button and set it set hide if zero to 
uh, what value do you want to use there? We want to use the length of this text. So we have our text field, which is called prename add. And then we have our button. And we want to basically just pass the length of this field. So now we have an attribute called height of zero. And we're passing the length of this text field. So let's just run it. So this button should now be hidden so as long as the length of this text field is zero. So now there's no button. If I type, does it not change? Aha, uh -huh, yeah, that's true. We can't use this one. You need to use, we need to use our view model since that's the live data, otherwise it doesn't update. So we have our name text here, and then we have the length of that one. So this one updates because it's the live data. So uh, make sure if you need it to update, it should be live data, otherwise it's just kind of set. So now if we type, see as soon as we type a letter, the button is visible. And if there's nothing there, it's not visible. So say we wanted this attribute not to hide anymore, but we wanted it to, you know, disable if zero. We could just instead say view.enabled equals false, or otherwise view dot is enabled equals true. So well we can actually simplify this as it knows to if view.enabled equals that the value is not zero. So so now Obviously, I would have changed the name of the attribute to disable if zero. So now the button is still there, but it's disabled. So you could have used this in your first assignment, for example, for the confirm and cancel buttons to say, hey, if these fields are empty, disable this button. So, and then you wouldn't have to worry about anything else. You just put it in the XML and then it sort of hooks up. So you can see the power of this. That's how, how simple it becomes to create UIs that react to your data. So. Now this one reacts to the date length of the, the, this text. This one is a two-way data binding. It also sets this variable in the data binding, which this text field subscribes to. Uh, this filter but checkbox quickly I let you enable and disable filtering by just changing what live data is being used. Um, and now the button disables or enables based on that. Uh, all of the other variables are just set from this data binding layout as well. And if we add a new element called uh, a bird, I don't know if it's a bird, we get it back in here and everything updates and we can filter. Currently it's a match filter, so it's not actually partial match, but um, yeah. So you can write any sort of adapters you need for custom attributes. Now it is worth noting that this one is so simple that we wouldn't have needed an attribute for it. We could have simply directly said, um, and they enabled um, to this to this variable. Well, it's actually it takes a boolean, so we have to actually say I equals zero. So we, since the expression is so simple, we didn't even have to write our own attribute for it. We could just put it directly in the in the attribute enabled. And now, well, it seems to be inverted. Yeah not equal to zero. But you know, you see how fast it is to also update the logic. So. And you can use this to drive color. You can use it to drive what icon or drawable is there. For example, for this image we view, we could update, uh, we could, well, the image view is actually part of the recycle view, but you can drive almost any parameter in, in the UI with this stuff and you can write expressions in there as we saw with the this one so you can do that for anything like if you want um want this go button to say can't go if it's this one is empty if you want to drive have this checkbox drive something else as well we can just add it and so we can add this to anything we can we can add it to the card view we could say we can say we can say visibility to be a checkbox. Well, I didn't call it that. I called it filter box. Filter box dot checked. But since, since actually visibility requires a view dot gone or view dot visible, 
we can actually also use those variables in here. So we want to use this as the Boolean and use view.visible. However, if you want to use data types like this, there's one more statement you can use in this data section. Uh, and that's an import. And we want to import the type view, uh, not this view, the other view, uh, that one. And now we can use those variables in here. So now we have access to view.visible if it's checked or otherwise view.gone. So you can actually write a lot of expressions in here and use uh, have UI interact with each other as well. So now this card is only, oct oct only visible if this text is checked, which makes no sense, but you can do it. And unless there are any questions, I think that is going to be more than enough to digest. And hopefully you can see uh, see the power of this and uh, yeah, I see people appreciate that we used expenses for this. And I guess, yeah, so the reason for that is again that you used it for your first assignment. So you'll be very familiar with this. And since all of you have tried to solve it without these tools, you can now see how you would have been able to solve it with, with this tool and the power that you get uh, for your app when actually using this, uh, this stuff. So uh, if you have questions, you can ask them now. If not, you can also send me a message on Discord if you run into specifics, specific issues with this. And hopefully uh, a lot of you will be using this on your second assignment and your project because, well, you should see the power of it. And even though you might not remember everything, this will be available as a recording. So you can go and watch it at any time. You can send me a message. Uh, yeah, we um, use the view bindings for, for, for example, we use it for all the other fragments uh, and we also use it well, since we replaced it with data binding here, we actually don't use it for this one. So that's, but we use view binding for the activity and the other class because they are less UI intensive. So it makes sense to not necessarily create a data binding there because as I mentioned, uh, data bindings take longer to generate and are more effort to create. So for every class that we don't use a data binding, we are now using a view binding because that's the default. Um, another trick. Well, I mean, it's just for build times. It's not for runtime. It's uh, actually like a lot better performance. You get better performance at runtime because the, you, have, you create the classes up front with all of the bindings. So everything is sort of there, but uh, it's only in build times. I haven't measured it. So yeah, so view, view bindings is the default that you should be going to. And the data bindings are for compl more complex UIs where you have more interactions like this one. Here's a lot of, there's a lot of variables depending on each other, a lot of stuff going on. So if you need that power, you can just enable the data bindings for it. And if not, you can just do the regular way with the view bindings and observe to the live data manually, which works if you just need, need something quickly, because it's not always worth to put it up if you just need to test something fast. So, I mean, I guess the overheads aren't really a worry technically, but, uh, View bindings are a lot faster to just get into your project because you just have to say view bindings enabled equals true. So you just have to enable it. Uh, you just enable it in here and now it's generated for every single class. Yeah, you, you deal with the complexity better and you can, and with a lot of, when a lot of the UI stuff depends on other stuff, you, you just set it up in the XML and your fragment or activity becomes super clean because you don't actually deal with any of the UI interactions in there. Because if you can imagine like setting up all of these interactions manually without a data binding, live, bind, live data or view model or anything, like this would have been an absolute pain to take care of. Like if you, especially if you consider screen rotations as well, which I've disabled now, If you consider this as well and have making sure that it's a consistent state after you wrote it, for example, that you want this checkbox to be checked still. I guess that was a bad example. No, it's actually still checked. Uh, if you want the text to remain, you know, if you want the D to D to remain in this one, once you rotate, now it's still there. It wouldn't have been if you didn't use any of this stuff. And then also all of the filtering and that you can toggle the filtering, like all of this, you would have have you would have had to manage this manually if you didn't use any of these libraries. So you can see it can be 
see it as a huge time saver and a productivity boost for creating uh, big wraps. Which you are going to do for the next assignment. So now we should be able to push it farther with less effort. Well, you still need to do learn to use the libraries, but you can use, refer, reference these lectures to do so. So yeah, I think that's all it for the questions. And I will update this project on the slides as well to the wiki. So you can uh, look at it, look at the example and play around with it. So if you want a task for next week, then, or you want to play around with it, then take the expense entry fragment, uh, make sure that you make it use a view binding in here, maybe create some interactions, more advanced interactions in the UI here as well. Maybe disable this button if these text fields aren't enabled with data binding. Maybe um, uh, do this something similar with the council button. Maybe you can change the color of the button depending on how long your name is. So the longer your name is, uh, the redder, the more red the button becomes. So you, these, are, these are all things that you can do. So see if you take this example, which is already set up and add some uh, view and data bindings to this other fragment, which is currently uh, just using the old stuff. Um, the quick last tip is that you can also use data binding for these recycler view elements, which means you writing recycler view adapters becomes a lot easier because you will only have to, uh, you, you can set the data of each item automatically. So if you want some tips on that, we can do it later. I don't have time for it now. So, so yeah, I will post everything and thank you for showing up and taking part in the lecture. And I hope you learned a lot of new cool tricks this week as well as last week. And then I will see you again tomorrow uh, at 10. So yeah, thank you.